Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Gurjeet. Obviously, that's apparent from the slide. Uh, so hopefully, I'll be able to give you some insight into how the databases work and improve or help you in, in your daily job, uh, at least understanding what your developers are doing or what your database is doing, the, doing behind the scenes. So before I do, one of the fun things or fun parts of working for a corporation is that you have to pitch their lines. So we have a contest going on at, at Enterprise DB. If you tweet about, about this talk with those hashtags PG Open 2014 and copy Enterprise DB, you can win a free training, uh, a drawing into a training. So who am I? I'm a database architect at Enterprise DB. Uh, I, I find it interesting that somebody told you should expect as an audience to know who is standing in front of you, what qualifies me uh, to present this talk. And so I have been involved with databases for about 14 years now. I started my job as a database internals guy. Currently, I'm working at, as a database architect at Enterprise DB. And I have been involved in various other things. Uh, one of the, these are some of the highlights. Index advisor, uh, optimizer hints that are compatible with Oracle's query optimizer hints. I worked on, the, on a single component in Postgres Enterprise Manager. I have also worked on the team that developed Postgres plus cloud database. Uh, from open source contributions perspective, I contribute to Postgres on a fairly regular basis. And uh, one of the most recent, the one that I kind of single-handedly handedly developed is the Postgres Hibernator. That is still under discussions. Hopefully it will get contributed. Even if it is not, it's an extension, so it can live outside of the community and uh, still be useful to the customers and users. So one of the important lessons in life is to learn from your mistakes. So, I am here because I learned from my mistakes, because I was curious, try to learn. So hopefully you will also do that uh, in your jobs. And hopefully this talk also gives you a little bit of insight that will make you kind of adventurous to delve deeper into your databases, learn from your mistakes, whatever you, wrong you were doing before, hopefully that'll, you can fix that. So the goal of this talk is to impart some new knowledge whatever little amount of knowledge that might be, uh, that helps you do your job better. Uh, the last few slides are, is where the meat of the talk is. There is not much content on the slides, but I'll be talking to you about how the database actually works. And it's kind of difficult to explain without the animations and all on the presentation. So uh, hopefully uh, that'll add, add to the knowledge. So agenda is to cover ACID. If you have seen a recent marketing push from Enterprise DB, NoSQL on ACID. So we'll see what ACID is all about and how is it like competing with NoSQL or how it complements NoSQL. Uh, then we'll see the application interaction, uh, how applications interact with the databases, how the database handles those requests from the applications in the backend operations section. And then in the third topic will be concurrent or cooperating operations, that means there are many applications talking to the database, how the database manages to serve all these applications at the same time. And one small component that often gets ignored is the, the interaction by the, with the database, of the database with the operating system and the disk where the data is actually living. Because that's a very crucial component, all the tuning, all the consultancy that you hire, uh, all the database architects you would hire to improve your database performance, that's what they look at. So if you understand that component of your database, how the database is actually using the disks, uh, you might get a better understanding. You won't have to hire another guy to solve your problem. And specifically, we will not be talking about NoSQL. That means when I say databases, RDBMS, that's what I'm talking about. Acid compliant databases, Oracle, SQL Server, uh, the uh, MySQL's engine, uh, InnoDB engine, not the MySAM engine. So these all qualify to be ca called RDBMSs. Uh, NoSQL databases, we won't uh, cover those in this presentation. So ACID, ACID defines certain traits of a transaction in an RDBMS. What that means is, uh, what is expected of a transaction? A transaction is a group of operations select, insert, update, delete, as defined by the SQL language, the SQL standard. These are the commands that are part of a transaction. And these are the traits. ACID defines the traits that a transaction is supposed to exhibit and 
First of, all, uh, first of them is atomicity. That means all the changes done by a transaction are atomic. That means either all the changes succeed, or if there's even a single change that fails, all the transactions should be rolled back. That means the database should be in a state that it was in before the transaction began. If there was a single error, the whole transaction rolls back. Consistency, that means a transaction begins and takes the database from one consistent state to the next consistent state. That means all the, con all the constraints that were enforced before the transaction became, all the primary keys, all the foreign keys, check constraints, not null constraints, all the triggers that are in place, all of those should be still valid after the transaction finishes, after it commits. So that's the consistency. Isolation, you would see that, okay, if there are a single transaction runs at a single time, it's very easy to provide that isolation. That means one transaction performs its job, there's no other activity in the database, it's very easy to implement, it's performant. But the performant RDBMS is one that serves multiple transactions or multiple queries at the same time, while also giving the feeling of an isolation to a transaction. That means the, isol the transaction should behave as if it is running singly. There is no other activity in the database. So that is the feature provided by the RDBMS. And there are different isolation levels. So isolation is not a single thing. So there are read consistent isolation levels, uh, serializable isolation level. We won't be covering those, but at least you are now dangerous enough to know that, okay, there are different isolation levels. You can go and inquire about those and use them. And then the last and very important component of an RDBMS of a is, is of a transaction is durability. That means a transaction once that is committed is durable. What that means is if the database crashes, if the power, there's a power loss, if there's, there are disks that crash, after the system comes back online, the transaction that was committed is available again. All the changes that were made by the transaction are available again. So that means transaction is durable. So these are the traits of a transaction that should be provided by, an, uh, by a database. So when all these uh, traits are available in a transaction, we call them asset compliant databases. So NoSQL. Why we don't want to talk about NoSQL here, and this will be the last slide on this topic, is they compromise on at least one of these core traits of a transaction. When I say at least, that means sometimes they compromise on more than one. Sometimes they don't provide you atomicity of transactions. They don't provide you isolation or consistency, or maybe they've failed to provide durability of your transaction. That means, so when you hear the term eventually consistent, that's what they're compromising on, on durability. Your transactions may be lost. You have committed your transaction, you have made a change, and the application has gone ahead based on that change, based on that committed transaction, and got, gone ahead and performed some other actions but if that transaction is not durable, that means all the changes that you made after that are kind of inconsistent. In a banking transaction, for example, if one of the database is not providing you durability, the other database is, there's a transaction that happens from one bank to the other. One bank doesn't provide the durability and the other one does. The first bank that provides durability will have a state that shows there was a transaction, whereas the other bank's database will say there was no transaction if there was a crash after the, after the commit. So it's very important that your databases provide you asset, uh, asset properties. So very high level picture, uh, how applications interact with the database. You write applications in various languages, VB, .NET, ASP, Java, JavaScript, whatnot. Everything is available. There are different ways of talking to the database. But what it eventually boils down to is how do you communicate with your database? You write your application, you execute queries, or you use a driver to talk to the database. And the, it is the, eventually the driver that communicates with the database. Because the driver is developed by the same community or the same organization which knows how the database can talk to the rest of the world. So that is defined by the protocol. A network protocol that says this is how I'm going to expect the query and this is how I'm going to send back the results. A protocol may define how the number of columns in the results are communicated, how the data types of the columns are communicated, number of rows, etc. So this enables like client-server architecture wherein your application is not actually living on the same machine as the database, but it is isolated from that, and you can actually build entire architectures on that. You might have multiple components between your application and your eventual database, final database, 
which may be responsible for transaction load balancing, trans transaction rescheduling, to improve the performance or the performance of your application. So once the, the queries or the commands by the applications are submitted to the database, these are the primary operations, very high level operations that a database backend does. And we are talking about a single backend. And we are going to take on this topic in, in a, from a different angle when multiple backends come into the picture. So what does a single backend do for processing your query? When I say backend, it would be a single process in case of Postgres or Oracle. It could be a single thread in, in another architecture. So a backend is a dedicated processing unit that is assigned to your connection, your application connection that performs all the operations that applica application wants to do. Say application wants to update and give a 10% bonus to all the employees, it would send a query, but it is connected to a client or a backend on the, on the server side, on the database side, and that is actually the process that is doing that update. It's not the application that is doing it. Application just sent out the command. So the backend per performs these operations. Very, at very high level, it is parsing or tokenization of the string. Uh, then the parse analysis, query optimization, and execution. We'll see, a look at the, uh, all these operations one at a time. So the first is tokenization and parsing. So let's say the application wanted to join two tables, employee and department, and it wanted to join those tab two tables on a specific condition. Give me all the, all the employees uh, whose name is Agent Smith and who, and I want them, there might be multiple Agent Smiths from multiple departments or maybe from the same department. So I want to list all the employee IDs that have the name Agent Smith and their department names. So this is the query that would be sent. The tokenizer would break this query down. It's a single text blob that is sent to the database. It would be broken down into individual tokens. And when we say tokens, these are basically white space separated strings. So select is one token, E is one token, period, etc. These are all other tokens. One distinction between like not all white space is the same. You can see there is a white space in Agent Smith. That is not considered to be a token separator. So anything that's within the single literal, uh, literal string, uh, single quotes, is treated as one token, one value. So the parser takes this token, uh, tokenized stream and converts that into a parse tree. It compares that against a syntax that is understood by the database. So it's just the parser that understands. If the parser doesn't understand the syntax, it doesn't know what to do with it. Whether it's a select command, whether it's an update command, or what operation eventually wants to, wants to, uh, the application wants to do, the parser converts that command into a structure that the, data, the rest of the database can understand. So this is a parse tree that comes out of the parser, the output of the par uh, tokenization and parsing stage. So it might look like a data structure that holds all the select lists, all the from lists, all the where lists. Every database would call them differently. Some would call it relation, some would call it product projection. Uh, the select would list is in relational algebra is called projection. Uh, but for simplicity, for the sake of this presentation, we are going to call them by the name, uh, by the place where they are uh, found. So there is a select list, there is a from list, there is a join clause that is hung off the from, from list. And there is a filter or a where list which specifies what kind of filter it is uh, that the application wants. Keep in mind that the parser did not take care or verify that any of these objects exist. Employee doesn't exist, it doesn't care. Department doesn't exist, doesn't care. Uh, the columns within those tables, so any kind of validation is not done at this stage. Syntax and parsing is just about the string, the input that came from the application. So this parse tree is then fed into the parse analysis stage. And this, it is this component's responsibility to validate the whole string, the whole structure that was sent by the parsing stage. It ensures that the objects exist, that they make sense in the places that they are listed. So if you want to list a function in a from list, it might not make sense. Certain functions make sense, certain other functions. So if, uh, and then if there might be an operator that compares a employee name with a string, then it's valid operation. But if there is no such operator that compares an employee name is equal to a string, then it would throw an error at this stage. It would say, I do not know how to compare employee name with a string. 
So this is the parse analysis stage that takes care of validating the input that, okay, this query makes sense. Now I can do something with it. So that's where the planning and optimization comes in. So that tree is then forwarded to the backend operations. Uh, the, the next stage of backend operations is planning and optimization. They are one and the same thing, planning and optimization, but they are called like planner and optimizer interchangeably. So what it does is it generates all the possible ways a relation can be accessed, a relation or a table, and which one would be the best given the complete context of the query. So there are different ways a table can be accessed, full table scan, that is like the brain dead way of scan through the beginning of the block, from the beginning of the block to the end of the uh, block, and emit all the rows. There can be index scan. That can be beneficial when there is a where clause on a column that also has an index or bitmap index scan, there is a full table or uh, index only scan. So there are various methods by which a relation can be accessed. After figuring out how to best access a single object, it then figures out how best to join two nodes, two tables. So that's where the joining strategies come, in, come into play. So nested loop join, hash joins, and sort merge join. These are the primary ways of joining two tables, two relations. And the result of a nested loop join can be again treated as a relation and joined with the other tables. So it can become a complete tree if you have more than two objects. In our example, we just have two objects that we are joining. But if you are joining, let's say, three objects, first two objects will be joined. The result of that join will be joined with the third object, and so on and so forth. So other operations that it optimizes for is ordering distinct operations, uh, grouping, uh, pruning out the groups, et cetera. And then choosing the best plan. So it has generated or it has evaluated different methods to access the objects and to join them. The best plan that it picks is dependent upon what the application wants. If the application is interested in just the first few rows of the result set, it would choose a different plan, which may not be the best one, but it is best for that scenario. But if the application says, OK, I might have 10,000 rows in the result set, but I want all of them, then it would choose a different plan because the other way of accessing the, the other plan might give you the complete result faster. So there are different ways of uh, generating the plan, and it chooses the best depending upon the situation. So this is what the plan tree or the execution tree looks like. This is the output of the optimizer stage. So the optimizer has chosen to perform a scan on, or index scan on employee table. The index scan would scan out filter out all the rows that do not have the name Agent Smith, uh, and then send it out to the nested loop. It will be joined with the full table scan on the department table, because that might be the cheaper way of accessing the department table. Even though there was a where condition or a join clause that we could have used, but this might be better in terms of cost. And the join result is sent to the client. So this plan tree or the execution tree is sent over to the execution engine or execution stage. And the, you would think that this is a brain dead because the, all the logic, all the dis decision making was done by the planner optimizer. It's a very complex, complex component. It's not simple. But that's where Postgres also shines. It has a very good query optimizer. And that makes us kind of stand out from the rest of the open source databases. So it has done all the hard work of making sure that it, it performs an operation or serves a query in an optimal manner, then you would think executor is just a branded, brain dead component that just takes what the planner has given it and then process and return the results. Uh, but it's not that brain dead. It has its own optimizations built in. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, this is all it does. It takes the execu execution tree. We'll talk about that picture again. It takes the execution tree and tries to pull out the row from the top node, the result node. But the result node doesn't have any rows. It will try to pull the results out of its child node, that is the nested loop. But nested loop, again, doesn't produce any rows. The nested loop will ask for a node uh, or a row from the left node, left child, that is the index scan. And index scan will scan the index that it is supposed to. Look for all. It will discard all the rows that do not have a name is equal to Agent Smith. The first one it finds with the name Agent Smith, that row will be fed into the nested loop joint. The nested loop will then like take that one row, 
and scan all the rows in the department table. Basically, it will ask the department table to give one row at a time. So it will finish that scan and join it. And when we say join, what that means is it will only the output of the nested loop will be only the rows, the set of rows where the left node's department ID is equal to right node's ID column. If that where clause matches, those rows will be sent out to the result node. And that row will be sent out to the application. And this will continue until the index scan on the left side does not produce any more rows. So as long as the index scan produces rows, each row on the left-hand side will cause a full table scan on the department table on the right-hand side. So that is an example of a select query, wherein the executor takes an execution tree and performs a select, basically scans the tables or indexes and produces the rows. But the execution tree or the execution engine is also responsible for insert, update, and delete operations. In Postgres, a delete, in delete of a row doesn't actually remove the row from the database. It actually just marks the row that, okay, I'm going to delete it. So we'll be talking about multi-version concurrency control in brief, but that's where MVCC comes into the play, wherein, wherein the row is not actually removed, it's only marked for removal. And it will be eventually revo removed by, a, by an operation called vacuuming. So, an update in Postgres is similar to delete. That means it will mark the old row as kind of ready for deletion and create a new version of the row and put that in the database. So that is called MVCC in short, means there are multiple versions of a row. You might have a primary key constraint that says there cannot be no, any more than one row with the ID two. So that the primary key constraint ensures that but actually on your disk, there might be multiple versions of that row depending upon how many operations or how many update operations have been performed on that row. So every transaction that updates a row with the ID two will create a newer version of the row. So if you actually scan your disk or your database behind the scenes, it has kept multiple versions of your row that has an ID two. So it's the responsibility of the database engine to make sure that at any given point to, for an every, any given transaction, only one row is visible. So that ensures the guarantee that, okay, primary key will always ensure a single row, a single version of a row that is visible to the client. So multi-version concurrency control, simple terms, there are multiple versions of a row or data available behind the scenes. So the execution engine finally sends the data back to the client and the operation is over. It would have been very simple to implement such a database, but unfortunately, such a database will not give you any decent amount of performance because it's only going to serve one query or one transaction at a time. And that's easy to implement, as we have seen. Just go through the motions, do the parsing, do the planning, do the execution, and return the results. But the complexity of a database comes when you have to serve many connections, many, many clients simultaneously. They all are doing different operations. Some of them are interested in selecting data. Others are updating it. Some are batch updating it. So all that mix of workload needs to be handled by the database. And it needs to handle them in a way while retaining the asset properties of a transaction. They all need to be isolated from each other they should feel, the transaction should feel that it is the only operation in progress in the database while database is performing also multiple other operations parallelly. So in, in terms of concurrent and cooperating operations, the database has to do read data from disk in a cooperating way. That means all the backends, there are multiple backends, they should read the data in a way that they are cooperating with each other. With each other. That means one piece of data that is read from the disk doesn't need to be reread again. If every backend tries to read the same block of data, it's wasteful work. That doesn't help anything. And then after reading the data, they have to share the data. And sh while sharing the data, they have to be very careful to not step on each other's toes. Basically, if you're updating a row, that row should be blocked from another update until that first transaction who's updating it is committed. And finally, after the updates have been done, writing the dirty data. When I say dirty, that means modified data. Writing the modified data back to disk, again, needs to be done in a cooperative way so that it's done only once, not multiple times. So a database takes care of doing all of that stuff, 
But before we look at uh, how data is actually, how database manages to do that, uh, let's look at the physical structure of a block. It might help you make a better mental model of what the database does on the disk level, on the storage layer. So this is what a block looks like. All the database operations are done in blocks. And typically, Postgres block is eight kilobytes. Why it is that way, you can research it more. Again, be curious, be like, try to learn uh, why th that decision makes sense. Some applications, uh, size of 16 kilobyte blocks makes sense. Some applications, four kilobyte blocks makes sense. But by default, Postgres has eight kilobyte uh, data blocks. And all the table data and all the index data, that's primarily what the database is supposed to do, uh, managing indexes and tables, all of that data is managed in eight kilobyte blocks. And this is what the block looks like. A block has a block header that has its own metadata, that has its own information whether the data is clean, the whole block is clean, whether it needs to be flushed, at what point it was last modified, so on and so forth, number of rows in it. So that all information is con contained in a fixed size block header. After the block header comes to the row, row pointers. Uh, these are fixed size but variable number, a data structure that is right after the block header. And they basically point to the beginning of rows. A simpleton mind would say, why not just place the rows right after the block headers? Uh, it would mean that every time you want to scan a row, let's say the rows were actually at the beginning of the block, uh, right after the block header, to get to the last row, you would have to scan all the rows. For each row, you would have to see how long the row is, go to the next row, then figure out how long that row is, and so on and so forth to get to the last row. But this organization helps the database to jump to the last row or any row at random without much of a calculation or without much of a traversal. So if it wants to get to the second row, it knows where the row pointer for the second row would be. So it would just simply jump to the second row pointer and the row pointer will contain the location of the beginning of the row that may be right there in, in the middle of the block. So this organization, what, uh, what it allows to do is accessing rows at random in a random fashion. And this organization, like one of, the, uh, one of the side effects of this is that whenever you insert a new row in a block, it goes to the end of the block. The next row goes before it, and the next row goes before it. So you can see the free space actually shrinks from both the sides. And that free space is where the next row will go in. So any questions on this or anything until now? Yes. So, it, so it, those pointers are ordered mm -hmm. by what? So it would say, let's say it's performing an index scan, right? Index has pointers to the rows. Mm -hmm. When we say, okay, find me all the rows that have the employee name is equal to Agent Smith. Index would say, okay, I found a row in my index structure, and this is where you would find it. At that pointer from the index is actually a location of this row pointer. It says this block and pointer number 10. So it won't have to, the, block, the database engine will simply access the block and read the 10th pointer because it knows where the 10th pointer is because block header is fixed size and each pointer, all the nine pointers are fixed size. So it can simply go to the 10th pointer with simple arithmetic. And from that pointer, it will go to the row. So it's not, when it's performing, let's say, full table scan, it doesn't make sense to jump around. Then you would access these pointers one at a time. But if, when you're performing an index scan, Index has locations of these pointers, not the positions of the rows. Right, so it's just a physical location in terms of this is the first row, this is the second row, this is the third row. Mm -hmm. my, my rows are not actually physically ordered properly right. in the database. Like, mm -hmm. So those, in your example, uh, the primary key would have them ordered. Right. But in the table, they might be totally scattered over, all over the place in different blocks. Right. So that order from the primary key will tell which row lies where, in which block. And from that pointer, it, you land here. And from this pointer, you actually get the row. Right. So yeah, any other questions? So just like a block has a block header to contain or store its metadata, every row also has its metadata. And when we, when we were talking about 
MVCC, multi-version concurrency control, all that information is embedded in the row headers. Which transaction created a version of row, which transaction is about to delete a row, etc. That, that information is stored in the row header. So every row has a row header as well. So that is used in the management of the uh, data, uh, multi multiple versions of the rows. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't cover MVCC uh, completely uh, or even the planning stage, but there are very good talks by Bruce Mongean that cover MVCC in detail, what happens, like he takes you through the examples, how the multiple versions act inside the database. So I would suggest that you, you at least browse through those presentations. So the purpose of MVCC in Postgres at least is provide isolation. A transaction will ignore the changes that were done by a transaction that began after it. That means at, say, 10 o'clock in the morning, a transaction starts, and 10.01, another transaction starts. So the trans second transaction might finish in the sense it might make a change, database change, and commit the transaction and go away its way. But the transaction that started at 10 o'clock might still run for a few minutes after that. When it encounters the change made by transaction two that started after it, it has to ignore that because that happened some, that, that is something that happened in the future from the perspective of the transaction. The transaction gives you a view of a database as, is, as it existed when the transaction started. So anything that happens or starts after the transaction began should be ignored. So MVCC helps you do that. A transaction ignores changes done by running transactions. That means any transaction that hasn't committed yet. It doesn't matter whether the transaction began after it or before it. Until the transaction's data has been committed, it should not be visible to other transactions. The transaction also ignores changes done by rollback transactions. That means that's the property of consistency. Any change made by a rollback transaction should not affect the database. So MVCC helps ensure that. So in simple terms, a transaction only sees the changes by the transaction that began before it and that committed. Anything else, I don't worry about that. I don't care about that. So this also provides effectively readers do not block writers and writers do not block readers. That means if there is a change going on, that means a transaction is running, that is, that is the writer transaction, it has made a lot of modifications. Those modifications are not visible to any other transaction because it's a writer, they're, because there are older versions of the row that make the database look consistent. And those versions of the rows will be used, not the modified in progress versions of the rows. Conversely, writers do not block readers. That means if there is a transaction going on, a reader will not be bothered to stop for a writer. That if it hasn't committed, it doesn't worry because there might be other versions of the row that make my view of the database consistent. So MVCC provides atomicity, isolation, and consistency. So consistency is actually not provided by MVCC. It's something that the database backend ensures. That means before it performs a commit, it ensures that all the operations that it did make the, all the constraint checks pass, primary key constraints, foreign key constraints, null, nulls, et cetera. So that consistency is kind of built into the backend operations itself, but MVCC provides atomicity along with commit log. That means all a transaction may take minutes or hours to perform its operations changes, but for the whole life of that transaction, the data is not visible to anybody. The data is visible instantaneously when that transaction commits, and that is recorded in the commit log. So immediately after the transaction commits, it becomes, its, its data becomes atomically visible to all the other transactions that began begin after it. And it also, MVCC also provides isolation because you are working as if you have complete control of your database. You have a view of a database that is not being modified by any other transaction. So you have isolation, you are isolated from all the other transactions, concurrent transactions. Well, here's the full Monty. I hope, I mean, I can uh, uh, do a fair, uh, fair job of explaining uh, what I want to explain. So all the operations that we saw until now were kind of single backend operations, query optimization, uh, execution of the, of the queries, et cetera. This is what your database looks like, uh, at least from the perspective of the database. There are clients that are connecting over the network. It could be a TCP IP network or a local Unix domain socket network. Uh, 
each of the client is actually being served by one of the backends. So there are, for each client connected to the database, there, could, there would be one backend connect, uh, live in the backend. So this is one of the reasons you might want a connection pooler. When you say, why do I need connection pooler? That's where your number of clients is much more than what the database can serve at any given time. A connection pool actually funnels down the number of connections. So a pool holds all, let's say, 100 connections, but you might have 1,000 clients picking the pool, a connection from the pool and executing the queries. So database is actually managing only 100 connections in, the, in, its, in, its, uh, in its environment, but it's actually serving thousands of clients. So for each client, there's one backend responsible for it. All the operations requested by the client are done by the backend on its behalf. The postmaster is the parent process. That is the root of the process tree. That means when you start a database, the postmaster starts and it creates this shade buffers, and it creates all the data structures that are needed for the operations of the database. And then it creates each backend for each connection. So when the co client connects, it's actually connecting to the postmaster. It is connecting, it's a first request that says, please give me a backend. So the postmaster creates a new process and says, now here's your backend, here's your process, talk to it. Postmaster is not involved in that picture anymore. And Postmaster also is responsible for other processes, background processes called Check Pointer, Auto Vacuum, and BG Writer. We'll cover those also. Let me see how am I doing on time. So when we said the backends cooperate with each other, reading and writing disk or data from the disk or to the disk, this is what it looks like. A backend, let's say client says, select star from employee. That means the backend is supposed to scan the table, employee table, from the first block to the last block of the uh, table. First, it will look in the shade buffers. Is that, the f is that first block visible or available in the shade buffers? If yes, well and good. I just can scan all the rows in that block and return the results to the client, and I'll then look for the second block. But what if the second block is not available in the shade buffers? Well. I have to now make a request to the disk and ask that actually it's not actually a direct request to the disk, it's a request to the operating system. So it makes an API call to the operating system and says, give me second block, block number that starts, like block that starts from eight kilobyte offset until 16 kilobyte offset. So give me eight kilobyte of data. And operating system will actually make a request to the disk controller. So there is a small piece of software called the controller, disk controller that lives or is associated with the disk itself, that request goes down to the controller and controller is the one actually reads the data off of the platter and sends the data up to the operating system. On the way back to the operating system, that block or the data can be cached by the controller in the controller cache. That means the next time the request comes, I don't have to move my disk around to get the same data. I can just give it out of my cache. So that's first layer, layer of data caching. After the data has been passed on to the kernel, the operating system, the kernel would create a cache of its own. That next time an application, not just this application that is requesting the data now, any other application, whenever that requests the same piece of data, instead of going to the controller and asking for it, I'll give it out of my disk cache. So it creates its own cache. Now you can see there's like two layers of caching already in place. After the data has been put in the disk cache, the operating system hands over that eight kilobyte chunk of data to the Postgres backend that was requesting it. And that backend puts that data in the shade buffers. Now you can see that the same data lives in three places, in the shade buffers, in, control, in the kernel cache, and in the controller cache. Now let's say another backend comes along and says it's performing index scan on the employee table and now it wants the second block of the data. It doesn't have to look around and find the block because or request the same block from the kernel because that block is now requested by backend one and it's already in place by the time it ends. So the second backend simply scans that block because it's performing an index scan. It doesn't care about what happened to block number one. At all it cares about it is second block that it is interested in, scans it and sends the results back to the client. So this is reading or cooperating to perform the read operations. What happens when you perform a write operation on a, on a table? There is something called write ahead log. In the full Monty, there are very important operations, write ahead log, check pointing, auto vacuum, and BG writer. 
So we'll talk about write ahead log right now. <clears throat> when we talk about, we have seen that MVCC and the backends make sure that they provide the atomicity, consistency, and isolation. But what about durability? Who provides durability? The mechanism called write ahead log provides durability. Durability says whenever my transaction commits, my data should be on disk. That means if the power, there's a power loss, whenever I restart, my data should be available. To ensure that, what we Postgres backends do is, whenever you perform a change to a record in a block, before actually record is modified, a change record is written into write ahead log or the wall that says this is a sequential write to a file that says I'm going to modify this block. I haven't modified it yet, but I'm going to. So that's a record, a change record that is kept separate from your actual data blocks. The purpose of that is when a transaction is modifying a a lot of records, it would be touching multiple blocks in the shade buffers. It would be touching multiple blocks from the disk, right? So if at commit point, you want to make sure that the modified data is persistent, you would have to write the blocks at random positions in the disk. And writing to the disk in a random fashion is very expensive, very slow. But writing to a disk in a sequential fashion is very fast. So it doesn't do that. When you perform a commit, it doesn't commit the data or flush the dirty data, modified data to the disk. It actually flushes the sequential data that was written to the write ahead log to the disk because that was a sequential write operation that is very fast to flush down to the disk. So what happens is when you perform a commit, transaction commit, your, all the data that was written to the write ahead log is not being flushed right at when it is being written, but it is being flushed to the disk when it is committed. So what happens is, after the commit response is sent to the client, the disk is, the disk is consistent with the transaction log, the write ahead log, not with the data blocks. And that ensures durability because after that commit, if the database server crashes, there is a power loss or a disk crash, after the recovery is performed, the database will make sure that it will replay that log because it has the change record. It might not have the dirty data from the buffers that was lost, but it has the transaction log data that was written and ensured that it was persistent on the disk before the crash. So it will replay that and bring the blocks up to date because that change record contains what block was modified, what position in the block was modified, and what was the data on the block that was written. So that ensures the durability. So we have covered all the properties of asset, how database provides those, and the check pointer. Now you can see that transaction log is actually an infinitely growing transaction log. It's a file that just contains changes upon changes. If your database runs for thousands of years, it would, have, it would grow infinitely. There's no limit on that. Uh, there are physical limits, but of course, uh, we don't have infinitely large database disks. So to ensure that we don't grow the transaction log infinitely, we have a process called checkpointing. What that does is, checkpointer wakes up periodically, five minutes, 10 minutes, it it is configurable. Or it would wake up when you have generated certain amount of transaction log. If you have generated 100 megabytes, you can configure that. Okay, after I have generated 100 megabytes, you perform a checkpoint. What's the purpose of checkpoint? Is to take all the dirty buffers in the memory and flush them to the data disk, to the data blocks. So the disk is consistent with the shared buffers now. After it has done that, anything that is in the transaction log before that point, after the database is consistent, all the change records that are in the transaction log, they are not needed anymore. Now they can be truncated. So transaction log is kept under check by the checkpointing process. So checkpointer makes sure the date shared buffers are from time to time are flushed to the disk and transaction log is truncated. When you say transaction log, you mean wall? Yes, wall. Write ahead log. Write ahead log simply means before you actually do a write, create this log create the records in this log. And that is done by the wall, wall buffer. So all your changes are actually first written to the wall buffers. Whenever you perform a commit, those wall buffers are written to the transaction log, that is the file, and committed or flushed to the disk. And then the commit response is sent to the client. And we have seen there are multiple versions of the rows kept in the database at various times. As the database age grows, some versions of the rows are not visible to anybody, right? There are versions of the rows that are visible to running transactions, but then there are older versions of the row that are not visible to anybody. So that's where the auto vacuum daemon comes into the play, which says 
scan the whole database, basically one table at a time, scan the database, and find all the rows that are not visible to any, any transaction, either current or any future transaction. Those are called the dead rows. And a auto vacuum process takes care of actually removing those dead rows and creating that free space that we saw. It usually shrinks, but the vacuuming and auto vacuuming process actually compacts that and provides a bigger free space, bigger chunk of free space. So that is auto vacuum process. And BG Writer, as we have seen, there is only a limited amount of shade buffers. What happens when the shade buffers is full, right? If the block in the shade buffer is clean, that means it has not been modified. You can simply chuck it out because there's no change. You don't need to write it. You don't need to take care of it. You can chuck it out and create, pull up new buffer that you need for your operations into the shade buffer. But what happens with the dirty buffers? Check pointers take care, takes care of them, but on a periodic basis. It's not doing that constantly. It's on a periodic basis. So that's where the BG writer comes into play. If BG writer wasn't around, a database, when it needs to pull new block from the disk and into shade buffers, it would have to first write a dirty block back to the disk. So that will slow down its own operations. So BG Writer actually takes care of that ahead of time. So it's a constantly running process. It sleeps for milliseconds, wakes up again, scans for dirty buffers that haven't been written for very long, and then writes them down to the disk and marks them clean. That means once they are clean, they can be chucked out by the next backend operation. So BG Writer is another backend process uh, that helps uh, keep the database up and running constantly. So that's the full Monty. And hopefully, that gave you a better picture of how the database, multiple components in the database work. Uh, any questions? No, no. So that's, yeah. When I said I learned from my mistakes, okay. the first time I explained it to somebody about nine years ago, I made that mistake. So transaction log is completely isolated. That means every change that you make, before that change in the block, you actually create a transaction log record. You write it to the disk on commit. That's it. It's not read back ever. It's only the check pointer that will read the dirty blocks and write to the data blocks flush them down. So the transaction log, it's not transfer log, it's transaction log. The transaction log is never read back. It's only written to. All the operations write to it. The only time when a transaction log is read from is on crash recovery. Oh, okay. If there is a database crash, that's when the database knows, I did not perform a checkpoint. Let me start recovery. And where does it perform the recovery? From the transaction log, it knows where the checkpoint was done. Roll forward the transaction log from that point, And I have to play the record that says, change this block at this position, put this data in place. So transaction log is, that's why it's very, very, very performant to write to the transaction log. And that's why database uses that te technique rather than writing to random places on the disk. Any other questions? All right. Hopefully you got something. Thank you.